As you said, I'm a postdoc research associate at Iowa State University pursuing my PhD in pharmacokinetics. So today we're going to discuss antibiotic use and resistance. And to start with the objectives, um, we're going to discuss the history of medicine and antibiotics. And we want to discuss this history because the history of medicine is the history of antibiotics, which is the history of resistance. Resistance has been occurring longer than we've been using antimicrobials, and bacteria were developing resistance to substances in nature as part of their survival and their evolution since before humans began using antibiotics for treatment. And now we're also going to discuss the antibiotic's mechanism of action. In other words, how does the antibiotic affect the bacteria? And this is important because we want to be able to understand how they can be inactivated. We're also going to discuss bacterial resistance. In other words, how does that bacteria become resistant to that antibiotic? And then we're going to discuss some steps that we can all take in our daily pig care in order to minimize the amount of antibiotic resistance. So around 2700 BC, Chinese herbal medicine began, and Chinese herbal medicine is still in use today in many parts of the world, including in the U.S., and it's used throughout different types of medicine as well. The Code of Hammurabi was established around 2200 B.C., and this is where malpractice penalties were first uh, discussed. In one of the rules, it discusses that if a veterinary surgeon performs a serious operation on an ox and cures it, the owner will pay the veterinarian. However, if the veterinarian performs a serious operation and kills the ox, then the veterinarian will pay the owner. This is the first um, event in which we see malpractice events, and this could be due to either surgically or pharmacologically. The Egyptian Ebers around 1500 B.C., discussed um, disease conditions and treatments, and in one of them they discussed to expel diseases in the belly, mix beer and drink. Now, I'm not so sure how that's going to get rid of a disease in the belly because it doesn't do that for me, but, I mean, that's what they did. Then um, Egyptian medicine continued, and it was handed down to the Greeks. Hippocrates was a Greek physician who founded the School of Medicine. He established uh, medicine as a profession and developed the oath, first do no harm. This helped to maintain the high ethical standard that is still practiced by medical professions today, both human and veterinary medicine. Aristotle guided medicine towards scientific methods <clears throat> and away from superstitions. Evidence-based medicine is important and it's still in use today. This is how we as veterinarians can determine the first line of treatment. We can use clinical signs, history of the herd, and past treatment response in order to develop a treatment plan. The Publius Vegetius around the 5th century developed a guide to veterinary medicine which included prescriptions for farm animals. <clears throat> During the fall of Rome and the Dark Ages, medical achievement was at a standstill. At this time, treatment of the sick was not governed by law. It wasn't written down and recorded. Pharmacology abandoned experimental aspects and regressed to herbalism. Medical practice was dominated by the church and unscientific techniques such as prayer, laying of hands, the use of holy oils, and exorcisms. Theophrastus Bombastus was a pioneer of the medical revolution after the Dark Ages. He expounded on the concept that all substances are poison, and it only depends upon the dose whether a poison is a poison. He was coined as the father of toxicology. He discovered that the poppy flower shown here, the latex could be extracted from that seed pod and used for pain control. That's opium, and we still use opium as pain control today. <coughs> Experimentation continued during the 17th and 18th century. John Hunter was a controlled experimentation. He was a skilled surgeon, and he had a passion for this research in wound healing, transplantation, oncology, and many other um, areas of medicine. 
William Withering discovered that the foxglove, shown in this plant here, could be used for increasing con cardiac contractility or the ability of the heart to pump blood through the body. And it could also control irregular heart rate. We later discovered that that was digitalin, and that drug is still in use today in heart disease. Edward Jenner, the father of vaccination, he used fluid from a cowpox blister and scratched it into the skin of an eight-year-old boy. This led to the development of the smallpox vaccine. <clears throat> James Blake, he developed foundations of principles still used in pharmacology today, such as IDing the site of action for drugs and determining how the what the mechanism of action is for these drugs. We're going to discuss these today and their importance in the development of antibiotic resistance. Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. He discovered that a mold could inhibit bacteria. And that got him the joint Nobel Prize in medicine in 1945. By 1940, penicillin was purified and mass produced. And it was coined as the miracle cure. <coughs> Sorry. An example of how he may have discovered that is shown on this plate here. This plate is streaked with bacteria. And then each of those white discs that you can see have an antibiotic on it. This zone will inhibit, or the antibiotic inhibits the growth of the bacteria. You can see that some of the zones, like this one right here, are much larger than this one. And so this antibiotic will work much better on this bacteria that this is streaked on this plate. And this is still in use today for determining which antibiotic may be best used for bacteria, certain bacteria. Ads and posters like this were common during World War II because everyone believed that penicillin was the miracle cure and that it could treat anything. It had a huge advantage during World War II. And although Germany had discovered sulfa antimicrobials, they were mass produced, but they were really no match for this new miracle cure. A little bit of terminology background. Antimicrobials are Substances that are used against microorganisms, this can include the antifungals, which would be used against fungal classes, or antibiotics, which we're more familiar with, anti being against, and biotique being of microbial life or bacteria. They can be classified into bacteria static or bacteria cytal. Bacteria static will stop the bacteria from reproducing, but it will not kill it. And this is important because the duration of therapy of that antibiotic must be sufficient to allow the host to eradicate or kill that bacteria. They can do this by interfering with proteins, interfering with DNA, or cellular metabolism. <clears throat> It's also important because once you remove a bacterial stat, this is going to lead to growth of the bacteria again if your host was not able to successfully eradicate. And by shortcutting treatment, whether it's with the wrong antibiotic or not treating for the labeled time, we can induce resistance. The bacteria cytals will actually kill the bacteria. Examples would be telithromycin is a bacteria static against most bacteria. However, there are some certain bacteria that it does have bacteriocidal effects. Enrofloxacin and ceftiofur would be examples of a bacteriocidal. They're further classified into spectra. <coughs> For example, broad spectra antibiotics will work against a wide range of bacteria, such as acting on both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, while a narrow-spectra antibiotic would be useful against a particular species of bacteria or a specific class, such as gram-positive or gram-negative. 
The difference between gram positive and gram negative is <clears throat> the difference in the structure of their cell wall. So the gram positive bacteria will have a much thicker cell wall and it will be able to take up much more of the stain. The dark purple that you can see in this image here would be the gram positive bacteria. Your gram negative thanks. Your gram negative bacteria have a much thinner cell wall and therefore can't take up as much stain and they're only going to take up this light pink stain. <clears throat> Next we're going to discuss how do the antibiotics actually attack the bacteria and how do they affect the bacteria. So our susceptible host for example would be our pig and this is occurring in the pig. So this is a bacterial cell with a cell wall and once the antibiotic is inside the host it's going to seek out cells with specific characteristics. For example, many bacterial cells have a cell wall while animal cells do not have that cell wall. So the antibiotic will seek out the bacterial cells by looking for cell walls so that it can distinguish them. And once the antibiotic penetrates inside that bacterial cell, it must locate this target. Once it locates the target, it can and attaches to that target, it can carry out the actions that are going to destroy that bacterial cell. Let's talk about what antibiotics are going, going to do and what type of actions they use to harm these bacteria. We talked about the antibiotic getting into the cell and finding its target, but once it finds its target, then what happens? How is it going to inhibit that bacteria? Again, this dark blue line is our cell wall, our bacterial cell wall. Upon entry into the bacteria, <coughs> the antibiotic is going to seek out specific enzymes involved in daily cellular function and that's going to disrupt the daily functions of the cell. For example, cell membrane permeability disruption can lead to free movement of ions such as sodium and potassium ions and that's going to alter the environment inside the cell which is going to inhibit cellular growth. Also by affecting cell wall synthesis, the structure of that cell wall is disrupted. DNA and RNA are necessary for the bacteria to replicate. And by disrupting production of the DNA or RNA, the bacteria can't replicate. Ribosomes, shown by this little black blob here, um, make proteins that are going to be necessary for daily functions of the cell. And by the antibiotic inhibiting the ribosomes, those proteins can't be made and therefore those daily functions are interrupted. Some different types of antibiotic resistance. In other words, how is that bacteria getting, becoming resistant or is it already resistant? We have intrinsic resistance and acquired resistance. Intrinsic resistance is the ability of the bacteria to resist activity of antimicrobial naturally. In other words, they were never going to respond irregardless of human actions. It occurs in organisms that have never been susceptible to a particular drug. That bacteria doesn't have the target that that antibiotic needs to bind to and therefore it doesn't work and it has never worked and it never will work. Example of this Mycoplasma is resistant to penicillin. There's nothing that we have done and there's nothing that could do to change this. It is how mycoplasma is. It is never going to be susceptible to penicillin. Knowledge of this intrinsic resistance of the pathogen is important in avoiding inappropriate or ineffective therapies that can lead to acquired resistance. <coughs> Acquired resistance. This bacteria, it has the target and it responded to the antibiotic at some time, but it has gone through some type of change so that it no longer responds to that antibiotic. The bacteria can produce enzymes that inactivate the drug by destroying or adding chemical compounds. <clears throat> 
um, that do not allow interaction. They can also modify target sites so that the antibiotic has less of an attraction to the site that it normally binds to. Modification of the antibiotic molecule. <clears throat> this is one of the most successful bacterial strategies. They go through, uh, they alter, do chemical alteration via enzymes. So they produce enzymes that will make chemical changes to the antibiotic molecule, often by adding a compound such as this phosphate group. So this is a chemical group that can be added to that antibiotic compound inside the cell. And that's going to decrease the binding ability of the drug to that target. They can also produce enzymes that will destroy the bonds, and that will lead to antimicrobial destruction. Um, an, an easier way to look at this is this is our antibiotic, and these black circles here can represent the phosphate group. And so once that antibiotic is inside that cell, the bacteria is going to add these phosphate groups. And so you can see how this has changed the shape of our antibiotic or the makeup of our antibiotic. Therefore, the antibiotic can no longer bind to that target and no longer have an effect on that cell. Decrease antibiotic penetration and efflux. <clears throat> Again, a different type of cell, but this is our cell wall. And the goal of the antibiotic is to get through that cell wall. Bacteria can decrease the permeability of that cell wall by altering diffusion channels, and that's going to decrease the amount of antibiotic that can make it into that cell and have an effect on that cell. The bacteria can also produce more efflux pumps across the membrane in order to pump out the antibiotic. So the antibiotic has already gotten inside the cell but now that bacteria is going to pump out this antibiotic. And it, these uh, efflux pumps can be specific to a particular species of a bacteria, or it could affect a broad range of um, antibiotics. <clears throat> Changes in target site. Again, this is happening inside the pig. Our antibiotic crosses this cell wall binds to the target under normal circumstances, and then has an effect on that bacterial cell. By the bacteria making certain changes to this target site, there becomes a decreased affinity for the antibiotic for its target site. That's going to lead to an ineffective antibiotic on that cell. Example of this would be a target site mutation. <coughs> Again, this is what's normally occurring inside the pig. And you can see that this target protein has now changed shape and that this antibiotic is no longer going to fit in that target. If it doesn't fit in the target and bind, it's not going to have an effect on the bacteria. They can also do target site protection. <clears throat> At the, in this stage, the... Um, Bacteria has produced enzymes that are just going to fill that space, and our antibiotic, again, can no longer bind, again, no longer being effective on that bacterial cell. Another way is that they can have target replacement. <clears throat> During target replacement, the bacteria is going to produce similar targets that look the same <coughs> and perform similar functions However, when the antimicrobial binds to those new sites, the original targets are still available. They're not inhibited by the antimicrobial, and therefore they can continue on with normal daily function. So this is putting everything together. Again, we have our cell wall. The inactivating enzymes, this is where we would add that phosphate group. So the antibiotic are the red circles in here. So our antibiotic gets a phosphate group added to it, and therefore that's changed the chemical makeup of our antibiotic, and it can no longer have that effect. Decrease uptake, modifying that cell wall so the antibiotic can't even get into the cell and have an effect. The efflux pumps, pumping out that antibiotic so that it doesn't have an effect. Changes in the target. This target has been changed. 
that antibiotic cannot bind where it was supposed to, again, it's not going to be able to have an effect. The bacteria can also alter its DNA so that it changes the shape of the and uses its DNA to change the shape, therefore becoming useless. A different diagram. Our antibiotic is still the red. I believe that this diagram shows a better image of how that cell wall gets modified. So you can see that this is the typical cell wall in the blue, and now we have this modification to the cell wall, and that antibiotic cannot get in. Efflux pumps here, again, pumping that antibiotic out. Inactivation, uh, the yellow being the phosphate group, added to our antibiotic has changed the makeup of that antibiotic. That antibiotic is no longer going to be able to have an effect. Here's a different target modification. You can see in the first one that antibiotic fits nicely into that target. However, that change has made it where that antibiotic will not fit into that target. So what happens after our bacteria become resistant to the antibiotic? So in this first image here, the dark purple would be our bacteria that are resistant or have become resistant to the antibiotic, while the light purple are the ones that were susceptible to our antibiotic. <clears throat> so the antibiotic is going to go ahead and destroy the um, susceptible bacteria, leaving behind only the resistant bacteria. These resistant bacteria will then reproduce and create more resistant bacteria. So the next time that you use that antibiotic, you've got a large amount of resistant bacteria, which is why our antibiotic doesn't work. <clears throat> it's important to note that giving antibiotics to animals, including food animals, dogs, cats, all animals, and humans, with the improper dose, treating them with the incorrect antibiotic or for the improper amount of time can lead to resistance. Resistance is not an animal or a food animal issue. It is an issue for any and all species that use antibiotics. So what can we do in our daily pig care to help minimize the amount of antibiotic resistance? It's important to know that antibiotics are useful against bacterial cells, not viruses. We can't treat the viral infection. Viruses should be prevented through the use of vaccination and strict biosecurity in order to minimize disease transfer. Targeted treatments by collecting diagnostics to determine what the cause of the illness is and using the antibiotics necessary depending on those diagnostic results. We can also take it a step further and culture to determine the bacteria that are present which can help with the antibiotic choice. By knowing the herd history, you can better determine the risk of the herd and develop a treatment plan. And by only treating the ill or the at-risk animals, we can limit the use of antibiotics. <clears throat> working with a veterinarian to use the antibiotics according to label indications, using the proper dose, using the proper route of administration. <clears throat> under, under dosing on both time and dose can lead to ineffectiveness and increases our chances of resistance. Focusing on the sick pig and the acute pig, getting those pigs as soon as they get sick at the first sign of sickness and treating them with the drug of choice. <clears throat> Irregardless of continued antibiotic use, resistance will continue to occur naturally in bacteria. Remember, it's been occurring since before we started using antibiotics. Our role is to continue proper use in order to minimize the amount of resistance that continues. Antibiotics will continue to have a place in the treatment of humans and animals and we cannot separate antibiotics from animal health and welfare. And as we continue to use the same classes of antibiotics as humans, we need to take the steps to improve our daily treatment plans in order to minimize our role in resistance. Even as new antibiotics are developed, we can continue to make daily improvements on our usage 
and help decrease the amount of resistance that develops even to new drugs as they're developed.